In this video, we're going to talk about campus network security and blocking traffic. This is one of the more interesting and fun topics to discuss, and much of what we're going to state here comes from many, many years of experience uh, learned oftentimes the hard way. So let's dive in and tell you what we think. When you block traffic on your network, incoming or outgoing, there's a lot of considerations. And in this case, we are talking about campus networks. Enterprises are different. If you have employees and you have policies, you can enforce them any way you want and block in or outcoming traffic in any fashion that you want. On a campus, it's different. You have a large population of distinct users using your network for all sorts of different things. So best practices require a balance of blocking bad traffic and allowing some other traffic. But default needs to be to allow traffic, not to block it. If you decide to block something, a port, a protocol, you will almost certainly affect somebody on your campus in a negative fashion and they're gonna to have to work around this. So you really wanna think this through. Of course, there are a few items that we'll go over that you do need to block. You need to allow your network to be used in creative ways. Uh, you may have researchers who are actively using BitTorrent in order to download information that, or upload data sets. You may have professors who are using YouTube for educational videos uh, and trying to send their classes to them in order to do it. Depending on your learning management systems, you may actually have professors and end users using Facebook and creating communities and groups out of them in order to get their work done. But remember, stop the things that are the big vulnerabilities. So you need to block some items from the external network until they're fixed. You don't need a firewall for this. Access control lists on the border router are just as effective and they run at line speed. This is really important because firewalls will not run at the speed of your router. It costs less, it's less complicated, and it does not impact informants. And one thing to remember, your end users are going to get around most of what you're trying to protect in, in the firewall with email. They'll click that attachment, they'll open that attachment if it did not get scrubbed and infect your network in some way or end up launching a denial of service attack or end up infecting other machines with viruses through email. And this is a tough one to block. You can do a lot of stuff, but it's hard and it's a moving target. For our campus networks, best practices for blocking inbound traffic include not allowing a packets that are sourced from the campus public IPv4 and IPv6 address spaces, making sure there's no packets sourced from our private IPv4 address space, our unused IPv6 address space outside of the 2000-3 block, and note that RFC 6890 describes the special purpose IP address blocks, many of which are not routed on today's internet. These filters can be easily implemented on the campus border router. Blocking inbound ports. So which ports would you block? Well, for instance, remember that end user devices now have firewalls. So Windows has a firewall that is on by default. Uh, Macintoshes can have firewalls that are easy to turn on, and any server that's running on your campus should have a firewall in place or be locked down to absolute minimal services that need to be running on that box. Campus infrastructure does need to be protected, right? Simple border router filters are enough because you should be running firewalls on your campus individual devices. So campuses need to monitor incoming traffic to look for unusual trends. Uh, standard practice is to use an intrusion detection system and something like NetFlow in order to detect these unusual trends. Blocking outbound traffic. The best practice today for blocking outbound traffic involves not allowing traffic from any source IP address apart from those public IPv4 and 6 addresses that you use on your campus. If you're using NAT and you have a private IPv4 address space, correct, that should not be going out onto the internet. Making sure there's no packets sourced from our unused IPv6 address space outside of the 2000-3 block. These filters can be easily implemented on the campus border router. Blocking outbound ports. 
When you do this, it seriously inconveniences and actually degrades your network performance. For instance, if you do not allow SSH, SCP, SFTP, outgoing, incoming on your network, your network now has lost a great deal of its potential functionality for end users. So some sites block many TCP ports and really restrict people, but people are extremely clever and they will learn how to overload ports and use those ports for uh, actual functionality they were not meant to be used for. So even simple things like email, it needs ports 465, 587, 993, and 995 to send and receive email. These need to be open. So you want your network as open as possible. Some things are really hard to block, again, such as BitTorrent, because it can tunnel through port 80 or 443, which you do need to have open in order to be able to browse the web. Some outbound ports that are recommended to be blocked include 25, this is simple uh, mail transfer protocol, SMTP, uh, 123 UDP, right, for the network time protocol, and 135 through 139 TCP and UDP, this is the Microsoft NetBIOS system, and if you allow those ports to be open, uh, they will almost certainly be abused. SMTP, uh, we strongly recommend blocking outbound SMTP except for authorized campus SMTP servers. So the idea is that these servers, anybody who's sending email through them has already authenticated in some way and they should be allowed to send out over port 25. So this means users either have to relay or send their mail from your local SMTP server or they're going to use one of the encrypted and authenticated ports such as 465 and 587 to external SMTP servers. Very typical that people do this, for instance, with Google. Your local SMTP server can log all the emails and it can rate limit. And so the system admin on that server can keep track of what's happening. And if somebody begins to abuse their mail privileges and send out large amounts of spam from their box on the local SMTP server, you can catch this. It's easier to detect and control virus infected machines as well which are sending spam, and remember, this affects your network reputation. So if from your address block, a lot of spam or viruses go out and you are blacklisted by several of the blacklisting houses out there, then you need to get yourself off or people will not be able to actually send you email or even get to your network in some cases. When restricting access to resources on or from your campus network, such as YouTube or Facebook, should this be done? Remember, YouTube has quite a few valuable videos on it. The NSRC, for instance, has a website at learn.nsrc.org where our videos are actually on the YouTube servers and would not be accessible if YouTube was blocked by your campus. Multiple organizations do this, and so it's hard to take advantage of these educational materials if you do block them. In some cases, staff have legitimate uses for Facebook to maintain professional connections, or they may actually use Facebook for some of their class interactions, and note that as we have experienced time and again, clever students do seem to find a way around these types of blocks. Note, remember that universities are designed to attract clever people, so this is no surprise. One of our great stories was Facebook was blocked at a campus we went to, and the students went and figured out every single IP address of every remote service that Facebook used and they sent around a custom file with all of those to resolve those addresses locally and they were able to get around the Facebook block that had been done through DNS. Bandwidth shaping. Should you shape your bandwidth? This means, for instance, do you give every user a maximum of one megabit if you have, say, a 50 megabit connection? Well, it only takes 50 abusers to burn 50 megabits between them, right? And if you give everybody much less, you're penalizing everyone. And of course, there's legitimate use of large amounts of bandwidth most uh, from your network. So shaping and prioritization won't fix not having enough bandwidth. Basically, getting more bandwidth is what's fixed that, and that is a goal that you can work towards. Meanwhile, if you're monitoring and managing your network well, if you're using NetFlows, you can look for your top talkers. These are the people who are using the most bandwidth. You can figure out what they're doing. And if it looks to be not legitimate, you can talk to them, you can block them, you can do whatever you need to do. What about deep packet inspection? This is an expensive proposition. So you can classify, shape, or even block traffic by content. However, much traffic today, actually a huge amount, now runs over HTTPS, which means it's encrypted, which means you can't expect it. 
in addition, how do you distinguish between that humorous cat video and a veterinary medicine video? You can't. So if you're blocking videos based on what you believe to be content, likely it's not going to work. Inline products are extremely expensive. Uh, they cause significant bottlenecks. So out of line products such as Snort can be very useful for detecting malicious activity and then you can respond to it and you haven't spent nearly as much money as you would on a deep packet inspection box. Performance. So any device that you put in line becomes a bottleneck. Imagine that you have 10 megabits of connectivity today. Soon it's likely to be 100 and then a gig and then 10 gigs. So are you going to remember to adjust your filtering and your inspections as your traffic connectivity goes up? This means you have an overhead and you constantly have to adjust. You may be interested in looking online for the terminology science DMZ. This is a way to bypass your firewall entirely and allow research related work to take place outside of your firewall and in a protected manner. Um, and that way your scientists and your researchers can have access to your full network connectivity. So our summary so far is that pretty much all encompassing firewalls are useless and detrimental to campus traffic flow. One thing to remember, you may have purchased a very powerful machine, box, etc. with your firewall. It may claim that it supports up to 10 gigabits of traffic, but what it cannot support are large data flows. This means if you have a researcher who is trying to send a large amount of data and it goes through your firewall, no matter how powerful that firewall is, it will not be able to send all that data all at once at full speed. You can test this by attempting to send from behind the firewall and from outside the firewall and see just how much faster it is. There is lots and lots of proof of this online. Bandwidth shaping really does not work well. It's very difficult to get to use and generally it just penalizes more people than it helps. Deep packet inspection today with HTTPS really is not very useful. So what do we do now, now that we've told you that the firewalls and traditional architectures aren't all that useful? Well, you should continue to watch our videos and we'll give you some answers in the next couple.